Hi, folks. Denise Howell here. And boy, do we have a fun and ocean going episode of This Week in Law for you. We've got Omar Todd with us from the Sea Shepherd down in the Southern Whale Sanctuary. We've got Derek Bambauer from Brooklyn Law School. We've got cyber lawyer Kevin Thompson. And we're going to talk about the convergence of technology, communications, and the law, all next on This Week in Law. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Law is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twill, This Week in Law with Denise Howell, episode 157, recorded April 13, 2012. A lawyer in every port. This episode of This Week in Law is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Hi, folks, it's Denise Howell, and you've joined us for This Week in Law. And this week in law, we've got three lawyers and a seafaring vigilante uh, bringing to you here on the show. Very excited to introduce you to Omar Todd, who is the chief technical officer, all-around techie communications guy for the Sea Shepherd and their entire fleet. Hello, Omar. Hello there. It's wonderful to have you on the show. Um, in doing a little research on you and getting ready for the show, you have one of the greatest Twitter taglines I've ever read. So I'll just uh, use that by way of introduction to folks who aren't familiar with you. You're a transhumanist Aussie, Dutch German with an Arabic name, film producer for Cinemagine Films, Sea Shepherd Technical Director, Director, that's the Whale Wars show on Animal Planet for anyone who's not familiar, and cricket fanatic. Omar, I've got to tell you, when I've watched episodes of Whale Wars, thinking of you sitting around watching cricket matches on the boats is not the first thing that came to my mind. (laughs) <laughs> well, yes, um, it's only a recent thing that we even watched on the boats because now we have satellite apps all around the world. So, um, and it streams too. So, uh, we can actually watch a cricket game when. Uh, and I, you know, I, I've got to be careful. I just want to uh, see a bit of cricket on TV while they're all got limited access. So um, I have to be a little bit careful and, uh, you know, sneak sneak a view here and there when I can. Well, far be it for you guys to bend any rules. So we we wouldn't expect that of you at all. Um, Also joining us today from the No Sleep Till Brooklyn Law School, Derek Bambauer. Hello, Derek. Hi, thanks so much for having me. It's great to have you. Um, I'm very excited to get you on the show, and we'll talk later about a cool event that's going on uh, at your school a little later on in the week on Sunday. Um, And you've been paying attention to some very interesting legislation in Arizona that I also want to get into a bit later on the show. So it's great to have you. Thanks so much. Also joining us once again is the cyber lawyer himself from Davis McGrath in Chicago, Kevin Thompson. Well, thanks for having me, Denise. It's, uh, It's a pleasure to be back on. It's great to see you again, Kevin. All right. Well, since it's two in the morning in Australia where Omar is, I thought we'd maybe um, get into some stuff about the Sea Shepherd and uh, the things that you guys are contending with and have contended with over the years. And particularly in your capacity as technical director, Omar, I think you'll have some interesting uh, perspectives for our listeners and viewers on the show. So one thing I noticed is that you guys are involved in Uh, litigation that was filed in Seattle, Washington in the United States that uh, actually was filed by the Japanese folks. um, Let's see, their acronym is sort of euphemistic, uh, has something to do with research, the uh, Cetacean Research Society. Do I have that right? Yeah, the Cetacean Research Society. That's correct. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, all part of the um, all part of the International Whaling Commission, and uh, they all have their little organisations um, that they like acronyms. And uh, but basically, um, I mean, this is not my area, but um, they 
tried to prevent us from continuing uh, our anti-whaling activities down in the Southern Ocean during the campaign by filing an injunction. And uh, if you look through the uh, court transcripts, and they're readily online, in fact, they're, both, they're off our website, um, it's quite interesting where they uh, come in under the angle that, uh, of course, that uh, we are terrorists and, you know, dangerous. And, uh, uh, and of course, the judge, you know, would explain, well, you know, can you prove they've proved these claims? And, you know, what, why would uh, this jurisdiction in the US have any control on what happens in the Southern Ocean? So there was a jurisdiction issue. And then, of course, um, Australian uh, um, has had its own court action against the um, the Japanese whaling fleets in the past, and uh, we've had our own federal court order which prevents them technically from whaling in the Southern Oceans in the Australian Economic Zone, uh, which they're continuing to ignore. So the uh, the US uh, or the judge also mentioned, well, if you know if you're ignoring an Australian federal court order by being down there, you know, why have you chosen this jurisdiction instead? And of course, it comes down to the fact that Sea Shepherd has the uh, 501 charity status in the US and I think uh, they felt that if they can cont- attack the uh, headquarters of Sea Shepherd and perhaps the charity status then um, if they could remove that then they would you know, effectively kick the uh, the chair from under us. Um, but at this stage the judge wasn't too impressed with their uh, submissions and, uh, um, and uh, tossed them out to a point and uh, it goes to I think they've just recently, I think yesterday or the day before, they've actually filed an appeal on that. Right, well it's pretty interesting. Mm. It sounds like um, the judge wants them to not be in violation of any laws or equitable considerations if the, if he's going to even consider um, acting on their request to enjoin your activities, um, which is a pretty reasonable thing for the judge to do. So it sounds like um, they may have opened the door for consideration of a legal issue that they never wanted it, um, heard in a U.S. court. That's right. I and mean, also, it's a can of worms for anyone to litigate with this. You've got three different ships registered in three different jurisdictions, of which none of them are in the US. You've got uh, a Southern Ocean, where it's technically under international law, which is, you know, previously the rule of might. And the fleets usually tend to back up any laws down there. If you don't have a fleet down there, then really the rule of law is doesn't mean too much. I mean, you know, that's the problem with the Somalian pirates and, uh, you know, Australia claims the area down there, but uh, that doesn't mean that anyone, you know, has to actually you know, follow the rules or believe it, and Japan doesn't uh, agree with Australia's claim of the area. So it's a interesting angle. I think um, if I was a lawyer, and, and you know, obviously what your program is about, it's a very fascinating, um, um, uh, you know, play on the law and just how far a jurisdiction can go. You've got all these interesting aspects. You know, ships from different jurisdictions that are registered in different countries, uh, an area of, of the seas that are just outside the usual laws. So, you know, a, a charity-based organisation in the US that's having its charity status attacked while being a very popular organisation and, of course, with a TV show. So it's a, it's definitely something down the road that uh, we could might almost write a book or perhaps even a movie about. <laughs> exactly. Um, or, and you're in, what, the seventh season of the show right now? Um, the fifth season. Um, fifth season. We were in the fifth season of the show. Yeah, fifth season of the show. However, this year um, we've really ramped up the episodes. I mean, typically we have, you know, 12, 13 episodes every year. But now we have um, some specials this year. Um, we have the uh, Viking Shore, which is based in the Faroe Islands, and it's a um, six-part episode series. Um, we have the, a Galapagos Islands special, and we have a Nambian Seal special as well. So we've actually got the main Whale Wars Antarctic a show and plus we've got three specials attached to it so i think um over 20 episodes this year so um you know we're really bringing the um plight of these various issues to the public as best we can while the show is so popular and you know it is very popular at the moment right and i'm sure you as the technology and communications director have um some head-to-head contact with all of those complicated legal issues that you were mentioning a moment ago. I was reading that in 09, you guys were actually boarded and all of this reminded me, you know, on a much grander scale of what we saw in the U.S. um, last year, I think it was, 
gosh, time flies. It may have been two years ago now, uh, when Jason Chen of Gizmodo's computers and files, et cetera, were seized um, mm. in the investigation of a clandestine iPhone 4 that was uh, recorded on. This. But yeah, you remember that. So you guys mm. were boarded um, in a similar way and had a very broad sweeping request for information served on you uh, because your Japanese opponents were alleging that you guys had rammed some of their ships. And so the Australian authorities came down on you guys. Were you there on the boat when that happened? I have been on the boat um, at the time for a couple of these incidents. Um, the interesting thing about this is that you can tell the federal police turn up. They're reluctant. They they turn up. They sort of, hello, hello, and they're very friendly, fantastic supporters of Sea Shepherd. One even showed us on his phone that he actually had the screensaver as a Sea Shepherd logo. <laughs> so they they cruise around. Um, they they technically confiscate any footage they find and they have they, they sort of, drag their feet and arms around while they have to confiscate the footage, take it back because of Japan's complaint. Now, interesting enough, uh, it's never led to anything um, and we expected the usual this year and uh, when we landed this year for the first time, I think in a number of years, um, there was no one there and uh, yeah, no one boarded this year. And in fact, in Melbourne, when we landed in one of the ships in Melbourne, we did have the, um, I believe it was the, uh, the Sea Patrol police turn up and actually offer their, their time to volunteer to scrape some of the rust off the ship. So um, <laughs> we have excellent support in Australia and from the Australian people in regards to this. And uh, uh, and I think this year when the Jap Jap uh, Japan and their number of their ships are actually recorded being within Australian territory, within the 16 nautical mile area, um, which they're not supposed to be, they've really pushed some buttons here uh, on a national scale. So there's people that are feeling pretty strongly against whaling and of course once they found out that the ships were actually within our waters our legal waters not just our economic territory waters but within uh, uh you know very so close to the shore um it's uh, only helped our cause and of course you may have heard of the for uh, forest rescue men as well who also jumped on the ship and uh, on one of the, uh, the uh, Japanese ships and, uh, of course, an international outrage, you know, and some drama there. So I'm not sure if you actually heard of that. No, I had not. So that's fascinating. Um, hey, we've got the benefit of having an information law professor uh, with us today. So, Derek, I don't want to put you on the spot vis-a-vis -vis international or maritime or Australian law, but uh, I don't know if you had the chance to read the story about one of the various seizures they were subject to. I was struck by the breadth of the warrant, which asked for all edited and raw video footage, all edited and raw audio recordings, all still photographs, producer's notes, interview transcripts, production meeting minutes, post-production meeting minutes, as well as the ship's logbooks, global positioning system records, automatic radar plotting aid, purchase records, receipts, financial transaction records, voyage information, and navigational plotted charts. Uh, is this something that uh, you think may have been a little overreaching on the part of the judge who granted this warrant? Well, my sense is, is that it is, and I think it's actually in some ways a, a failure to adequately supervise the warrant, is that this isn't so much about using the warrant um, as a means of discovering evidence for pursuing a crime or whatnot. It's really just intended to impose uh, a transaction cost on the organization. And um, that's precisely why we're supposed to have disinterested magistrates is so that they prevent this type of abuse um, by private parties. And, um, you know, it, it's unfortunate we see it in the in the states as well with sort of overbroad warrants um, sweeping in a lot of evidence. And it strikes me that um, this really puts Sea Shepherd uh, in a difficult position because if they comply, it's enormously burdensome. And if they don't, they're um, potentially under under penalties of contempt. Right. So, Omar, do you remember what what happened or what has happened when these sorts of things has happened? I guess the, it, there has not just been one incidence of this. Yeah, there's not been one incident. I mean, um, it's interesting you actually uh, you read out the actual, um, you know, the information uh, from the warrant itself. Um, I remember it um, 
Uh, I mean, again, it wasn't my area, so I was just more amused by the, the you know, the <laughs> fact that they weren't that they weren't that interested, and uh, they seemed to casually grab what they needed, and we offered anything they needed. But we, we, you know, we we gave the information that they requested, and it, I think um, the information on the warrant, um, you know, they didn't get all of that. They just got, you know bits and pieces, they got the footage. I mean, of course, you've got to remember, you've got Animal Planet on there with high-definition footage as well. Uh, it's reasonably unrealistic for them to take all this. It just doesn't work that way. So that, I think they um, they did their job within reason, but I think, you know, some of it could have just got lost in the post, so to speak. So I really, it wasn't really difficult or, or, or you know, hard for us to come up with information because they weren't that detailed about what they wanted, um, even though the piece of paper itself may have been different. But we certainly complied uh, with anything they requested in person and they were very friendly. And so we were very friendly and, it, you know, it took a couple of hours, but uh, no problem. All right. There was one little detail in the coverage of this that I had to pull out and ask you about. Uh, the Japanese were alleging that you guys had rammed their ships and you folks countered that they were using a sonic weapon to disable the crew. Now, this strikes me as straight out of a book like Demon, which I read a few months ago. Uh, how did that work? Yeah, well, they have uh, acoustic sound device weapons, um, which basically they, you know, it's, it's funny. They they talk about us being violent. You know, here we are throwing, you know, stinky butter at them at uh, and 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 a, and a little bit of paint, and uh, we harass their ships a little bit, uh, and then they will throw concussion grenades. Um, um, you know, um, these military-style acoustic weapons, long-range acoustic weapons, uh, LRADs are called. Um, when, they, when they also pointed it out, uh, Chris Altman, actually, one of our helicopter pilots, while he was in the air going around the ships, which is, you know, can be quite dangerous um, and disorientating. And, uh, yeah, it's, you know, they have spent quite a lot of money and significant money upgrading their fleet. And last year they spent around $28 million of the tsunami funds, that uh, the relief funds that were sent around from around the world, specifically on the security of their fleet. And even the Prime Minister of Japan named us personally uh, as, as an organisation that should be punished and uh, pretty much declared war on us um, himself. So, you know, here we are, a small little non-profit organisation um, tr trying to save uh, whales who are our clients uh, against Japan. And, and it seems to be a little bit, uh, uh, you know, uh, something that we just can't quite understand why they're and give up. Um, they're using the most advanced weapons. They're using, uh, you know, difficult tactics, expensive PR campaigns, and it's an industry that loses money every year. It's a completely government subsidised industry. So, you know, it's it's a strange, strange business to see actually in person. And you you scratch your head and you think, well, why do these why do these people continue to do this? It doesn't seem to be any point. We're going to talk a little later on the show about uh, a court here in the United States. Uh, the Ninth Circuit, finding that um, violations of employer policies by employees in their use of the web can't be construed as a crime under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And Omar, I was just wondering if you've ever encountered in your capacity as technical director, um, your opponents trying to get creative with the laws of the various places that you might be in and targeting your uses of technology and communications. Um, as, uh -huh. you know, in furtherance of your goals as violating some local law and trying to go after you that way. You know, I could talk to you guys hours about the interesting things that are happening uh, in the cyber world, um, you know, whereas we're using technologies unknown before uh, UAVs last year. We used um, drones to actually track the ships down. We used social media ex um, extensively. And the changes just in the last couple of years that we've, as a small organisation, have adjusted to the online world um, – um, in regards to them um, using, um, they actually pay agents to go on various social network areas, forums and things like that, which we've discovered to mm -hmm. try to pers persuade other pub public people or, you know, other users to be against us. And we have found that uh, there's a number of paid people that uh, that try to be, um, that try to use publicity against us. So the, the cyber area and the cyber war between the organisations and philosophies are actually, it's it's becoming quite intense. And, 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 you know, we're now treating social media like 
like a fourth ship, like a, a total entity on its own that requires resources, crew and people and, um, you know, and I think they're the same. And the whole battleground of this area has been rewritten um, in the last couple of years. You know, now on the Sea of Irwin, we have a C-band satellite dish. I, I can't go into too much details, but I can say that uh, we have high-speed bandwidth um, all around the world, on-demand streaming. We have a number of high-definition cameras on board. We have many CCTV cameras on board. Um, and, you know, it's our, our war is almost, uh, on the information side, is almost if not almost more important now than the actual actions on the sea. So it's becoming a very interesting area and seeing it develop. And I'm spending more and more time every day countering, um, you know, on, uh, online publicity that's adverse or not adverse and, you know, trying to get support and all the latest social networks we're integrating with. Um, it's becoming, you know, m an area that's growing very quickly. And, uh, you know, my job is, <laughs> is, is it started part-time, but uh, it's, it's more than full-time now. I think um, a number of us are juggling, you know, five jobs at once. You know, I could be on the ship one day and then I could be spending two or three days on social media. <laughs> um, so right. it's becoming quite interesting. Well, that's how we met. You set up a Google Plus page and emailed me just a random user question about Google Plus, and I was thrilled to meet you and uh, and get to know firsthand what you guys are doing on the social media front. So um, it's great that you're using that in in your overall yeah. efforts. I, I do want to move on to some non Sea Shepherd topics today, but before I do, I just of wondered, uh, Kevin, do you have any? Sea Shepherd related questions for Omar before we move on to other things? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I thought it was interesting that, uh, uh uh, you know, Omar is talking about uh, the fourth boat, uh, where we you know we we might think of the press as the fourth estate, right? Uh, here that they've they've got the fourth boat, which is good. Um, I uh, w was sort of curious, uh, you know, like when when they they did have uh, uh, the seizures and they they, they took uh, the footage and stuff like that. Was there a, a a bit of a lag before you got that stuff back? Uh, was it uh, turned turned back over uh, in any reasonable length of time, Omar? Um, by memory, and it's happened a couple of times now, I think once it took a while, uh, a couple of months, and then as the years have progressed, it's got quicker and quicker. Um, I, I, the impression we get is that is the authorities on our side, the Australian side, because obviously I'm Australian, have become more disinterested in following this mandate every year that they're forced to do to, to the point where this year they didn't even show up. And, and this year, you know, when we, when we see, the, uh, see the shore and we're coming up um, and I I wasn't on campaign, um, but uh, we, we have, you know, we have lawed the lawyer numbers out and we're ready to call the lawyers as soon as we jump on shore and we're arrested, or no, but nothing happened last year. So in the past, it, it originally it was a long time, I think, um, you know, a number of months, but as the years have gone, it's got shorter and easier and, we, and we've become um, much more... Uh, um, I don't know, friendlier with the authorities, and uh, I think in, you know most Australians, even the ones that are forced to do the job, are actually quite supportive of Sea Shepherd. But that's certainly our impression, anyway. How about you, Derek? Okay, thanks. anything you're dying to know? I was just wondering if Sea Shepherd has the ability to do anything in real time to to share these things, uh, sort of live as it were. Ah, very good question. I mean, in a show like this, you know, I have to gloss over a lot of detail. Um, as I said, I could spend hours telling you about the technologies we're developing. I mean, next year is going to be an amazing year. We're, we're using technologies that are frankly almost Star Trek level of stuff. And no one, no one and no other charity on the planet, as far as I can tell, will be using the stuff we're playing with at the moment. Um, and a lot of it will be real time. Um, you know, I'm now dabbling with Hangouts. In fact, um, I, I jump on the bridge at Bardot for a crossing in a couple of days from Perth to Melbourne. Um, we're going to, uh, you know, do some sea trials and I'm going to be experimenting with Google Hangouts. And, uh, you know, mm. if people want to find our Google page and uh, I will be showing people in real time what's it like to crew on the ship. And, you know, um, 
And uh, on our primary ships in this, this upcoming season, uh, hopefully we won't have one down the Antarctica, but I suspect we probably will, um, there's going to be some amazing technology. And I, I wish I could talk about it, but I, I can't. But uh, there's, there's going to be some pretty amazing things. Although keeping in mind, in um, the one area we, since we're restricted to is because we've got Animal Planet uh, on board, um, we're restricted to a point on what we can send out in real time because, you know, they've got the rights to the footage originally. So we, we have to – we were on a very strict diet on what we can release because obviously it affects the show. Right. Yeah, I wanted to ask you specifically about that, actually. Um, I'm noticing that the show is just is available on iTunes and Amazon, and I wondered if you, you know, as a producer yourself and as someone intricately involved in uh, – generating the content for this show for the animal planet if you have any thoughts on you know the web versus tv distribution that's a topic that we touch on a lot on the show uh yeah it's it's interesting i mean i'm off to can shortly um mm -hmm. what i've just produced a, f a film called sparks and embers which is a, a, a romantic comedy based in um, london and it's a traditional format and my partner a guy called benjamin craig who's daniel craig's cousin um you know the 007 james bond fellow um he wrote his dissertation on this exact topic recently, uh, well, a few years ago, um, and we've been talking a lot about it in, in Cannes Film Festival, and I've been there last year. It's come up a lot more, and on one of my other projects, it's called the Dream Channel. It's a transmedia project where it's a online game on the web where people can join and then they become um, characters that win and get into a movie. So we're combining a game and a movie together in a transmedia way. So the industry is is looking at the online content. It's looking at streaming. It's looking at at movies, but it it can't quite wrap its head around the distribution of it. This is the this is what's slowing it down. You know, people are uh, have got very expensive distribution networks, and they don't want to let go. So I think the next three to four years, people are going to, um, in the industry, are going to f try to find ways to distribute content out through iTunes and Netflix and all these other new mediums without losing footage, uh, a fo you know, a foothold in the old um, distribution channels. But they will have to change. So from our point of view, yes, we are all looking at it on the, in the industry and it's certainly talked about all the time. Right. I mean, you guys are sort of in... The position where you could almost be a direct provider of all the coverage of what you're doing and, you know, just pick and choose among the various distribution channels that you use. So I think you're That's kind right. of... That's right. Well, if... Um, yeah. If Animal Planet is not on a campaign, say, for instance, we're doing a, a shark campaign mm -hmm. shortly and it's a smaller campaign, well, you know, we'll probably experiment with, with being um, streaming out straight from the internet, straight, um, straight up and, um, and distributing it through, you know, uh, many thou oh, millions of followers around the world. So we're definitely going to be looking at that stuff as, um, uh, as the year goes on. It's going to be quite an interesting year in technology-wise. And then we have one question from our IRC. Virgil there wants to know if you salvage the Gojira. <laughs> oh, the Gojira. Um, no. <laughs> it's, it's, it, it, it was taking on water. Um, the, it it uh, was towed for uh, a period of an evening and it was taking on water, so we had to scuttle it. So we removed all the, um, the gear on there. We removed the fuel. We stripped it down. And unfortunately, uh, she had to be let go. Um, and uh, you know, and uh, you can read all about it. Just do the uh, just do a search on Adi Gill sinking. Um, I, and uh, and of course, we replaced that ship with the what we originally called the Gojira, um, but now it's called the Bridget Bardot, which was the daddy actually of the Adi Gill. Um, and it um, it's a much larger ship and I'm probably a little stronger and safer. Um, and now that it's just had been upgraded, um, um, and we're about to, as I said, jump on it from Mel on Perth to Melbourne and uh, see how it goes. Um, but the original Arty Gill ship, which most people confuse with the Gondura because they look very similar, but the Arty Gill was only a, uh, a much smaller vessel and the Gondura or the Bridget Bardot is a much larger vessel. I hope I answered that question right. Okay, I think you did. 
All right, so let's move on to that uh, point that I raised a moment ago. There was a Ninth Circuit decision in the U.S. versus Nozel case, which is good news for all of us who um, are employed and uh, maybe using their computer every now and again to check Facebook or uh, purchase something on Amazon or something that might be technically in violation of the employer's computer usage policies. Uh, the Ninth Circuit with Judge Kaczynski writing for the entire panel uh, in, of 11 judges on the court with only one dissenter has decided that the Computer Fraud and Abu Abuse Act cannot be invoked there to turn those acts into criminal um, events, which I have to think is a good thing. Although there are several other circuits in the United States that have come down on the opposite side of that question. So this is the kind of thing that would be ripe to go before the Supreme Court at mm -hmm. some point. Uh, Derek, uh, have you read through Judge Kaczynski's opinion, which is always a, a good entertaining thing to do? I haven't yet had the chance to do that. Um, and do you have any thoughts on the case? I think it's a sensible outcome, and you're right that it does set up a circuit split over the CFAA, um, and it, in some ways it re, um, recapitulates the discussions uh, a few years ago from the uh, Lori Drew case about the Megan Myers suicide. And right. uh, in some ways, this is more sensible because it, it's awfully difficult, right, to determine when you violated your employer's uh, terms of use. So as you say, um, if your employer says, well, you know, you're, you're not permitted to, uh, to go on eBay, during uh, work hours, and you just absolutely have to sort of bid on that uh, lunchbox, then you might actually violate um, that, and thereby everything that you're doing on the network at that point is technically a violation of the CFAA. Um, there's some limits in there in terms of your employer's claims against you. There's a damages minimum, but uh, it is not something that would limit an uh, overzealous prosecutor. And so in some ways, this is really a question as much about notice as it is about um, authorization itself. Right. Uh, Kevin, do you think uh, this case is going to have any broad reaching ramifications and you think we may see it in the Supreme Court? I think it's a good chance we'll see it in the Supreme Court in, in some, some fashion. Maybe not this case, but uh, maybe in other case might, uh, you know, point out the split in the circuits. Um, the Seventh Circuit is one of the ones uh, that uh, has taken a different uh, point of view. And um, uh, I, I actually went, went back to try to look at that case, the 2006 case with very, very similar facts, uh, where you have uh, someone with a, uh, uh, someone bre breaching their um, terms of, uh, of use, a more of a, again, a trade secret case uh, where people have, have taken uh, the um, you know employers uh, private data and and used it for uh, you know the, the starting a, a competing company um, so you know even though the, this particular part of the, the the decision you know just deals with uh, the computer fraud and abuse act claims I think you know these people have you know a lot of lot of other charges to answer for in relating to um, you know trade secret and so forth Um it, the, the dissent is actually quite interesting reading. I, I would suggest uh, uh, people, if they read read the opinion, be sure to read the dissent as well. And uh, they, they certainly point out uh, that the one judge there that dissented um, is that uh, they're going pretty far out there to you know talk about all these other things that that might be. Uh, uh, violations of uh, the um, terms of use, such as going on Facebook or uh, or other personal uses that might be technically be violations, when they may not necessarily have had to do so to address the allegations in this particular case, where these people uh, were employees uh, who accessed uh, their uh, uh, employer's uh, private data, uh, you know, for for the purpose of uh, taking the data and using it to to start a competing company, they, I don't think there's much much doubt that they, they exceeded the authorization that was granted them by their employer when they did that. Uh, and uh, I, I think the dissent points out that they didn't have to go as far as they did in you know talking about this general rule, you know uh, that uh, of uh, you know that. You know, exceeding the scope of of that shouldn't be a computer fraud and abuse act violation. Where that they could have addressed the the specific allegations in this case a little more narrowly. Right. 
Um, well, I, I think it's interesting that when you read the opinion, Judge Kaczynski's actually sort of begging the other circuits to reconsider and describing how uh, he thinks that they decided those cases um, based on the individual facts where they wanted to go after some people who were engaged in some pretty bad activities as opposed to simply using the computer network for things that technically weren't authorized. Um, and he points out in a dramatic kind of way how a lot of pretty innocent activities could be swept under the rubric of a U.S. federal crime and how this could um, be used to intimidate employees by saying, you know, well, if you don't just voluntarily quit, we'll go ahead and let the authorities know that, you know, you were violating our policies and that's a federal crime. So um, I do think it will be interesting to see if this decision has any broader impact on the other circuits that have gone the other way or, or potentially on the Supreme Court, which does not love the Ninth Circuit, but um, this seems to be a situation where, where maybe it would go against the grain on that. Uh, Omar, it must be pretty interesting on the Sea Shepherd, um, you know, if somebody were to violate your uh, secrecy strictures, um, yeah, I have the feeling you wouldn't wait around for uh, a U.S. federal law or anything else to, to deal with that. Uh, no, we've had this problem. Um, when yeah. we're on the ships, I have to restrict the internet, um, you know, heavily. Um, well, basically, unplug it to a point. Um, only the officers and the, the commissioned officers and all that can, um, can be on it. And, you know, the, um, we've also had... Um, you know, people, you know, who unintentionally jump on Facebook and say, hi, everyone, we're at these coordinates. Look at us. Yay. And of course, we're like, oh, geez, don't say that. <laughs> However, on a separate issue, we've now started to use that to our advantage. You know, a couple of years ago, before my time, I'd like to add, um, we're a little bit green and uh, people would, you know, put their coordinates up. But uh, now we've actually used, um, you know, similar... Um, you know, no one's quite sure where we are and what we're doing because people, you know, people, we have entire forums dedicated to to gossiping about us and what we're doing and what we're thinking. It's it's quite astounding, particularly to when you're reading it from, from where, you know, when you're actually sitting on a ship or you're sitting elsewhere and you're actually reading what they're discussing. But yeah, it's um, becoming an interesting area. And of course, these days, the disclosures and NDAs I have to get crew to sign is almost as long as an encyclopedia now. So, um, and I've recently just had to um, write up a, a a, a sort of cyber document and cyber policy and social media policy documents as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting. It's interesting actually because I've got another interview with um, um, one, you know with your colleagues here um, from the here we are from Cyber Law PL, which is Bulgaria, I believe, uh, have also want to talk to us about some of the documentations we've written. So um, it's an area that is expanding. But yes, is is the answer. It's becoming quite interesting. Yes. Well, thanks for um, sharing that. You know, I mean, the Sea Shepherd is an, uh, an organization, an employer, just like uh, any other in some ways. And yet it's quite unique in several others. Um, let's talk, Derek, about this law in Arizona uh, that passed but is being amended. It is um, HB 2549. Uh, it's interesting because there are so many states who are interested in in passing something to make people feel secure that they're not going to be bullied online, they're not going to be harassed online. There is a lot of public concern about those issues these days. And so Arizona was forging ahead to do something about that. But uh, what they purported to do, at least in the initial version of the legislation as it was passed, was to make it unlawful to annoy or offend people online, among other things. Uh, Omar, I think that might mean that uh, all that fourth boat activity that you've been engaged in could be subject to um, criminal prosecution in Arizona. Um, <laughs> Derek, Derek, why don't you uh, tell us about this law and, and uh, where it stands now? So you explained it really well, Denise, which is that this is an attempt by the Arizona legislature to do something completely laudable, which is to deal with the problems of cyber harassment and cyber bullying online. Uh, the difficulty is they just didn't do a good job of it. So they took a statute that was drafted for the age of the Bell telephone system, and they uh, tried to just sort of dump in the word electronic or digital everywhere that you see telephone, and then um, passed it. And so uh, it, it seems something where... Um, 
the the sponsors, the drafters of the bill, didn't actually think that there were any constitutional problems with it, and they didn't appear to have asked for for much input on it. And um, interestingly, it passed both houses of the Arizona legislature, and it's now sitting out there, and, and Governor Brewer apparently can, can sign it at her discretion. And the sponsors are trying now to redraft it to deal with the sort of really obvious constitutional flaws that the bill has. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see if they're able to do so. The changes that have been reported in the press wouldn't be sufficient to save the bill. And um, I'm moving to Arizona in the summer to, to start at the University of Arizona's uh, law school and um, have already said that if they don't fix the bill, which is, is just tremendously overbroad and unconstitutional at this point, um, we'll be in court as soon as I get there to enjoy Wonderful. Good for you. That was propitious timing on your move. And uh, that's great that you get to start the law school there. Very fun uh, pioneering activity. Uh, Kevin, any thoughts on um, this particular uh, law and its impact on speech and freedom online? Well, I, I agree uh, that it, it is uh, so certainly overbroad as drafted. I certainly hope that uh, they're able to get it uh, amended in any uh, timely fashion. Um, I uh, uh, don't have much more to say about other than that. Yeah, it's. I think it's going to be a challenge for lots and lots of states and possibly the federal government in the United States, you know, because this concern about harassment and bullying is a real one. Um, you know, we talked about the Lori Drew case a few minutes ago and, you know, the reason they tried to shoehorn that into the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is because lawmakers, judges, legislators are looking for ways to be able to police things that just shouldn't be happening online or that, you know, were overly um, violent or otherwise threatening. And yet, we have to be sure to protect free speech too. So it's a very delicate balance. Um, Derek, do you think that any other states are doing a better job of this than Arizona did on its go round? Actually, there are a number of better examples. And I guess that's what's disappointing ultimately about the Arizona law is that there are models out there that address the exactly the problems the Arizona legislature is worried about, which is things like threats or stalking or repeated harassment online. So um, California, for example, has a provision that deals with um, threats, threatening language online that I think is, um, is well tailored. It covers uh, exactly the type of speech that we're worried about. It does so in a way that's uh, narrower. And so there are really two issues here. The first issue is about um, making the bill constitutional. And the second question is uh, a larger one, which is what do we think is problematic online and, and what sort of tolerance do we have for bad behavior online? And also just what bad behavior does the Constitution require that we tolerate online? So um, the Arizona bill, for example, talks about uh, language that is lewd or profane or annoying or offensive. Um, and that means that my blog is illegal in Arizona, uh, despite the fact that it's a law blog. And so I think that what um, is required in some ways is to have some modesty about our goals and to target speech that we think is or conduct that is particularly harmful, like threats um, and like harassment. And so there are actually good examples, California's, I think, being one of them, that Arizona could look to. And then, in fact, I've encouraged the drafters of the bill to look to. All right. Well, we will continue to monitor that issue. It's a big one in the U.S. and I'm sure elsewhere. Uh, Kevin, what do you think about this other issue that continues to raise its head from time to time, uh, the legality of embedding videos that may be infringing? Uh, the MPAA has filed an amicus brief in a case where it has taken the position uh, that that sort of activity might actually constitute direct mm -hmm. infringement. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, once again, that's the Seventh Circuit here uh, uh, taking the, the national spotlight uh, on this particular issue. Um, uh, should be interesting to see how the case turns out. Uh, I, I did manage to read through the MPAA's brief, uh, and, uh, you know, they, they take a very um, uh, interesting look at uh, just general issues of copyright law, and uh, what they're focusing on 
is that uh, – uh, violations of the display right, uh, which would be the embedding, uh, should be looked at separate from uh, what would be the reproduction right, which would be the, the actual people putting it on their servers and just in, in, distributing the uh, the uh, the video. Um, and uh, the uh, there is a uh, Ninth Circuit case uh, where they have a. Uh, a test where they look at you know whose server essentially is the the video on, and uh, the the MPAA is is arguing that uh, that the, uh, the the reproduction right should be treated separately, and so it shouldn't matter whose whose server it's on and and whether or not you've you know infringed the reproduction right uh, before whether or not they can you know find a violation of the display right, and uh, it. Uh, it uh, should be interesting to see how that that plays out in the end, and how receptive uh, other people are to that type of an argument. Um, you know, I, I did read through uh, some other briefs as well. I read through the EFF's brief, but which was filed last year, and so it didn't really address that particular uh, question. Yeah, so it seems like they're arguing that you could have direct copyright infringement without any actual copying. Derek, what do you think about that? So I think it's entirely possible as a theoretical matter. The derivative mm -hmm. works right, for example, there are the, the famous tile art cases out there where you don't have to have any copying whatsoever. And so, um, you know, people have said that in the Ninth Circuit, at least, if you sort of make notes in the margin of a book, you've probably created a derivative work. Uh, I think that the difficulty for the MPAA is to think about how far this rule that they propose cuts because if it's one, for example, where um, potentially if they fell outside of the Digital Lending Copyright Act's safe harbor, all Internet service providers and all web hosts would be liable for violations of the display right. I think that that's something that a court would be really reluctant to embrace. Yeah, it seems like one of those things Judge Kaczynski could write eloquently about sweeping a lot of innocent activity under too broad an umbrella. Alrighty then, uh, let's talk mm -hmm. to big news this week. Instagram uh, acquired by Facebook on the legal side, I guess, it, it, and we have a funny tweet that sort of um, uh, captures the humorous aspect of the legal side. If um, Chad can put that up for us, there it is. Um, and <laughs> it would, yeah, there we go. <laughs> so we've got poor me coffee saying, Facebook buying Instagram to provide seamless integration between photos of your dinner and the people who don't want to see them. Um, and now, well, that is a, a pretty funny way of encapsulating it. I think a lot of people are concerned that uh, they're by using Instagram for their photos, they were making some choices about who they were going to share those photos with uh, that might be different choices than uh, their universe of followers and connections on Facebook. And now uh, I think the concern is that those two things might be combined and those expectations would be upended. Uh, Kevin, do you think this is a big deal or no? Well, uh, th there was a, a good article uh, which looked at the actual terms of service. Um, the, the actual terms aren't all that different between Instagram and Facebook, um, you know. But I think there certainly are uh, some different uses. I think uh, people use Instagram a lot more to uh, take just general snapshots and you know share them around uh, versus necessarily um, you know wanting to be sort of the more permanent social record and you know, shared among all your, you know, your Facebook friends and so forth. Uh, so I, I do think there are different audiences and, and I think that's why, you know, Facebook bought them was to get access to that, uh, um, what, 30 million users that, uh, that they uh, developed with pretty much uh, uh, a lot of that is, is just uh, iOS users. Uh, they only just recently added an Android app. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think uh, that's so certainly a different audience there. Uh, for Facebook, that the, why they probably you know thought they were worth the money. Although I, I must admit, when I first heard the price, I was quite shocked. I knew that I was in the the, the wrong line of work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, uh, uh, you know it, but, the the price of coolness, I guess. Right, right. Which, you know, but, but which I think, Facebook is going to have to struggle to maintain. Mm -hmm. 
Right. And I think generally, though, uh, the thing to keep in mind, though, when you're using Instagram or any other service is, you know, public postings are public. And, uh, you know, to the, the terms, you know, can change uh, from time to time, uh, you know, sometimes without notice, depending on what service you're using. And uh, uh, Instagram people are c- certainly going to be discovering um once Facebook announces how this will actually integrate, just what changes are going to make. So uh, I think it's, uh, you know, stay tuned. Uh, I know some people have taken the the point of view that if Facebook bought them, you know, they're certainly, you know, not going to stay an Instagram user. Um, And that's certainly a choice that that people can make. Uh, But I don't think that's by by any means that can be the majority. I think uh, you know people. A lot of people are going to stick around and and see what changes come to Instagram as a result of this acquisition, and you know whether or not uh, you know that they can, um, you know, keep their their public pictures there. Right. I mean, it could just remain entirely the way it is, uh, just be under the Facebook umbrella. That's what they did with FriendFeed when they bought it. It's exactly right, right, the exactly. same as it's always been. Uh, Derek, any thoughts on this one? You know, I think what's interesting about this is that um, it's a really helpful set of insights that Kevin has about about the privacy policy. And it's thoughtful to look at the differences, but I wonder as a practical matter how much difference they make. Um, Facebook's privacy policy is impossible to read. Most users don't read it. Um, what really matters, I think, is, is, Denise, exactly your point, is whether or not the service stays the same. Is that um, by and large, everyone bemoans the fact, and rightly so, that um, users just don't care that much about privacy online. And so if they're getting the functionality that they want, then um, I think that they'll stay with Instagram. You know, every every time that um, Google integrates its privacy policies or Facebook makes a minor change, uh, it blows up in the tech media for a couple of days and then things go um, back to normal. All right. Well, Kevin has a train to catch and I don't want him to miss it. So we're going to yeah. let him go. Thank this you so much, Kevin, time. for joining us. And thanks again, Denise, for having me. And, uh, uh, you know, if, if Evan is, uh, you know, busy again at some other point, uh, but by all means, let me know and I'll see if I can uh, help you out again. Sure. Thank you so much for doing that. And we're going to have you on uh, when Evan is with us, too, because that's always fun as well. So oh, yes. go get your train. We're going to keep this train going in your absence. Um, but we wish you well. Take care. Thanks. Have a great thanks, day Evan. now. All right. You too. And uh, I'll go ahead and take this opportunity to thank our sponsor for this episode of This Week in Law, which is Netflix. Folks, I know you probably already use Netflix, but if you don't, we have a great 30-day free trial for you to take advantage of or to tell your friend or your mom or some family member who just maybe maybe hasn't quite got on the Netflix train yet. Uh, that there's a great way to try it for 30 days absolutely for free. And uh, the reason you want to do that is because of the thousands of TV episodes and movies that are available for streaming there directly to you instantly. It saves you time, money, and hassle, and it gives you access to this just incredible world of entertainment um, that, you know, particularly if you have kids and you're concerned about them having great things to watch, but not being bombarded by 20 minutes of commercials for every hour. Uh, This is a really wonderful way to go. My kid right now is watching the entire Tintin animated cartoon series that he's just totally in love with. Um, So that's just one of many, many examples of this material that will be there for you to stream. And you can access all that material in so many easy and instant ways Uh, You can watch Netflix movies and and TV shows on your PC, Mac, or iPad. There's a beautiful app for the iPad and the iPhone uh, and some Android phones too. If you have a gaming console, the Xbox 360, the PS3, the Nintendo Wii will all bring you Netflix into your home. If you're not a gamer, there are so many ways uh, to bring it in through a set talk box, either an Apple TV or a Roku. Lots and lots of DVD players are making this completely seamless. In fact, we just got a new um, receiver that has Netflix on it, of all things. So, you know, it's just being built into so many components that make it uh, almost silly not to have an account. 
Uh, you can watch all of that wonderful material instantly using any of those devices, and you can begin watching on one device and then finish on a different one. However you choose to access Netflix, you can watch as many movies and TV shows as you want, anytime you want, and you can cancel any time. So go to netflix.com slash twit for that 30-day free trial I was mentioning. When you use that URL, it lets them know that we sent you there, which we really appreciate. And we also really appreciate Netflix's support of This Week in Tech and This Week in Law. We hope you enjoy watching instantly with Netflix. So Omar, I have a question for you that wasn't in our discussion points, but I wonder since you're in Australia, if it's something that you've been paying attention to. There's been some interesting coverage of the Australian government uh, suing people for use of Wi-Fi, that they have some patents uh, and have reached some huge settlements uh, from Wi-Fi vendors. Have you been following this at all? Oh, you mean the CSIRO, um, which who apparently invented the technology? Well, didn't apparently they did invent the technology? Uh, yes. Yeah, there has been there has been um, some some things floating around. Um, uh, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out uh, because I think half of the planet's infringing on their on their technology, uh, certainly right. on the. Uh, the, the original patents and the copyright information. Um, it was funded. It was funded by a government body of Australia, and I'm not sure how tight the um, you know the intellectual property is. Um, but I mean, there's a number of things happening here at the moment, like everywhere else. You know, the government's looking at trying to force ISPs to police the internet, um, yeah, and an INET, which is uh, one of the I think it's the third largest ISP in Australia. Um, is doing everything its power to make sure that doesn't come through, and uh, yeah, I, I have been watching. I mean, it's, it's part, and I'm, I was always an internet engineer first, you know, before I was in Sea Shepherd. Um, so I have, and, and, and I owned my own internet service provider. So I do keep an eye on this type of thing. I mean, one of the things interesting about your show is you, you, you talk about. You know, Arizona, I think, was earlier on about these laws. I mean, the interesting thing is going to the, the, the problem with all the laws being introduced is one is only so much people can retain. I mean, you can technically be breaking. We're all breaking laws every day. It's whether anyone decides to enforce it or not. And you can be, you know, what's legal in one state is not exactly, you know, might be um, uh, legal or not legal in another state. I mean, how do you reinforce all this? I mean, where's the point when we're all going to say, well, it's got to be a global consensus of some sort? And uh, I think that's what we're all trying to grapple with at the moment. You know, you've got intellectual property um, being used on a global scale now, and, you know, and you've, as you said earlier on, um, this Wi-Fi issue is a good issue um, to discuss about that. And then you've got, you know, little laws like uh, cyberbullying laws, I mean, that are enforceable in one state and not another. I, I'm finding it... Um, um, that it's becoming a little bit more complicated before it will have to simplify out. I mean, I mean, I don't know what anyone else's opinion is about it, but I just can't see it continuing on the current level. It's just going to be too many laws infringed on too many levels in too many countries. Right. And, and probably, I don't know, but personally, I don't see any real end in sight to that kind of problem, but I agree with you that it's terribly frustrating and there's no consistency. Derek, this sounds like a good sort of policy question for someone in your position. What do you think? So this was actually, it's a fight that's been going on since the early days of the commercialization of the internet. Um, so the, the first version was that, um, Everyone thought that it would be impossible for states to actually regulate the internet, that we'd all just be able to work around it too easily. And then the second version was it turned out that um, states could regulate the internet pretty successfully, but we thought it was only the, the bad guys like China and Iran who were doing so. And now the, the third version of internet regulation, um, as Omar is mentioning, is that everybody wants a piece of it. So um, the, in the United States, right, the Obama administration is doing things like seizing domain names for gambling sites that are unlawful under U.S. law or sites selling fake National Football League jerseys or um, sites that offer um, streaming of Premier League matches. And this is something that is um, a sort of newly overt um, uh, work by the United States to impose its will on what we thought of as a global medium. And um, Australia has done the same thing. So um, the Rudd government tried quite hard to push through um, legislation that would have required ISPs to censor everything on um, ACMA's uh, blacklist. And that turns out not only to be, for example, pornographic sites, but um, some Queensland dentist who got reported and also a, a um, anti-abortion site. And so um, I think that uh, the differences between governments are just too strong for there to be any sort of international 
consensus about how to um, regulate a space that's as wild as the internet. And so I think that this chaos is just going to be ongoing. And I don't think that's necessarily bad. I don't mind that there are different rules in France than there are here in the States because um, we all get to move around. We all get to to live among like-minded people. And I'm not sure that I want um, a single sort of homogeneous set of rules for the internet. I would agree with Derek completely. Right. And, and it, uh, that certainly makes sense for, for someone who has the ability to literally move around uh, on all of your various fleet. <laughs> yeah, we would be, we, you know, we would be in trouble every day probably. But uh, I think in the long run, um, you know, you've got Australia, which is rolling out the MBN network, the National Broadband Network, which was the centrepiece for our uh, Labor government's election promise, an absolute centrepiece. Now, you know, they, they use the excuses that they want to roll out this national broadband network to make business more advanced, to have the most fastest network. I mean, we all know in the industry it's simply so they can regulate it and, uh, pr- you know, put under government control and probably down the road privatise it as well uh, and sell it for mm-hmm. billions. But, uh, you know, they're trying to create a national broadband network so they can control it and, um, you know, uh, at the end of the day, they can only control as far as Australia. And then, of course, you've got the, the problem of um, other jurisdictions, which I think um, is a good thing. I think the internet is what's forcing governments and everyone else to be a bit more transparent. And it's certainly putting our conscience as a species up, up a notch, which is a good thing, particularly when you're in conservation. You know, we couldn't spread our word anywhere near as far and hard if we didn't have the internet. And I'm, I think that's a good thing. Absolutely. All right. Well, we have uh, a couple of other legal stories before we get toward the end of the show here. Uh, One thing, there's not too much to discuss about it. It just sort of bears mentioning something we've uh, kind of tracked along as it's been happening. The DOJ has now actually initiated litigation against Apple and five publishers uh, alleging price fixing and unfair competition, uh, antitrust kinds of considerations uh, related to ebooks. That uh, the allegations are that Apple and these others are seeking to um, fix prices and have the mar- the market settle out at a retail price for ebooks somewhat higher than the nine ninety nine standard that Amazon seems to have set. Uh, and that they, according to the Department of Justice, who's been investigating, um, have, you know, taken some steps that go beyond what they should do in the realm of fair competition. The European Commission is also investigating these allegations. Uh, The DOJ has offered Apple and these other defendants some uh, settlement terms, which they have not taken up at this point. So it looks like this is going to go forward. Uh, Derek, do you have any thoughts on this? To me, based on the the documents I've seen so far, this just looks like classic price fixing. And the mm-hmm. uh, the arguments that have been put forward by uh, the publishers in particular are that this is necessary in some ways for their industry to survive. Um, and that's precisely the rhetoric that you hear in every antitrust case, right? We had to do this. This is actually pro-competition. We're not going to be able to survive without it. Um, and it turns out, right, that if it, um, if you look at the history of antitrust, uh, industries always adapt. And um, in part, this is, you know, they're sort of uh, trying to suggest that the, the sort of looming threat here is Amazon, right? And that they have to resist Amazon's price cutting. And and it's, I don't actually think that it presents uh, a risk for publishers. I mean, having ebooks is uh, an immensely profitable new market. It's just that they're not making as much in terms of profit margins as they'd like. And that's the whole point of competition. Um, the strange thing is that uh, in a world of declining physical book sales, ebooks may well be the savior. And it turns out that uh, content producers are just lousy uh, prognosticators when guessing about whether things are going to be good or bad for their industry. So uh, Jack Valenti, when he was working for the MPAA, famously compared the VCR. He said that the VCR is to the movie industry as the Boston Strangler was to a woman home alone. Um, And he turned out to be precisely wrong. The VCR saved the movie industry. DVD sales are saving it currently and internet-based distribution as with Netflix uh, will do so as well. And so the, the publishers are resisting this, not because it's any sort of threat to them, but because it's um, upsetting their the, the business models with which they're most familiar. Yep. So we'll just continue to watch that. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how the whole ebook pricing situation uh, shakes itself out because it's kind of wide open at this point. Um, finally, let's make this our last uh, story 
on substantive legal issues uh, in Boston last August. The First Circuit decided the Glick case. This was the fellow who was not making any secret about the fact that he was recording the police. Um, and he had some uh, pretty bad things happen to him, um, arrested and confiscated and charged. And uh, he came back and... Um, the, the basis of the case by the government against him was the wiretapping law in force in that jurisdiction. And what the First Circuit came down and said was in order to violate that law, you have to, that law anticipated secret audio recordings only. And that's not what was going on here with somebody openly videotaping the police. Um, so it was a great decision for citizen journalists and actual journalists. Um, oh gosh, no, I don't mean to imply that citizen journalists aren't actual journalists. Let's say mainstream instead. Um, everywhere. And uh, for anyone who just might be on hand when there is police activity going down, um, Mr. Glick brought a civil rights suit and that has been settled in his favor, favor for $170,000. Um, so I think he's been fully vindicated at this point. This is the kind of thing uh, that you play, pay close attention to at the Info Law blog, Derek. Um, what do you think about this case? I think it's critical, and it's, it's something that I would assume um, it would also be uh, a particular interest to Omar, because mm -hmm. in some senses, uh, Glick is really about not just journalism, but our rights to protect ourselves by recording what happens. So uh, some police departments have adopted the policy of recording all arrests and all interrogations for exactly these reasons. And um, there are some really profound implications for this, not just for journalism, but for how far the Glick decision uh, goes. So you mentioned the fact that the wiretapping statutes really seem to contemplate uh, circumstances in which for example, I'm uh, recording someone secretly or I'm, I'm uh, taping a phone call. And the question is really, is, is that the only limit here? Because one could think that perhaps the, the crux of the, the Glick case is that it's interaction with the state, it's interaction with the police. Or it might be that, in fact, any state and a number of states have what are called two-party consent rules. So it is unlawful to record a phone conversation, for example, unless you have the consent of both parties. And does that mean that those statutes are unconstitutional. And if so, that would be a major holding. But I think this uh, this ruling, even though it just applies to the First Circuit, is particularly important because we're seeing much more aggressive use of these um, eavesdropping prosecutions. And so, for example, one place that um, has a good deal of these is Chica uh, Chicago and Illinois more generally. And a Cook County court recently found that that state statute is unconstitutional, essentially along the same lines as the First Circuit. And so it's something that... Um, can be used to chill not only journalism, but our own ability to protect ourselves in a situation where we're, we're facing uh, force or the threat of force from the state. So I think it's, it's a powerful and um, decision that I think uh, is likely to influence uh, similar courts in, in future circumstances. Omar, have you guys ever turned the cameras on the police as they were boarding you attempting to confiscate things? Oh, for sure. Um, there's a fantastic bit of footage about this. Uh, I mean, for us, the camera is our most powerful weapon. It really mm -hmm. is. Um, you know, I mean, you've got, you know, of course, the cyber war and the ships and everything else, but the camera is what speaks a thousand words um, for us. And um, in, in a f recent film uh, um, that was produced in called Confessions of an Eco Terrorist, it's uh, Peter Brown's film, uh, and it's a documentary. It's just been released in the US at the moment. Uh, it has 35 years of him as a cameraman you know, following Sea Shepherd um, and some of the boardings and moments when the police, particularly the Faroe Islands police, boarded the ships and what would transpire and the fact that uh, the police were trying to read out an arrest warrant to Paul Watson, Captain Paul Watson, and there's like a thousand cameras surrounding them, you know, and they were very nervous and... Um, um, and this was, you know, a number of years ago. So, yeah, it's something that we, we, we look, we keep an eye on. But then, of course, you know, that's within a jurisdiction of a country. Now, you know, what happens if the Japanese board us in international waters while our cameras are, f are filming? I mean, you know, Sea Shepherd is testing 
uh, or will probably in the next couple of years test areas of the law that haven't really been tested before. So, um, you know, we, we, we wait to see what will happen. And, of course, you know, any case that comes up, we aggressively defend. And uh, so far, so good. We've had some successful time this year. In fact, we've had, I think, two or three co- cases this year which have gone our way. Um, again, it's on the Sea Shepherd website. I, I did post the link earlier on about the transcript of the particular case I was talking about uh, earlier on. And it's... Um, it's something that we're keeping an eye on. Um, and I suppose at the end of the day, you've just got to do what you think's right. And our organisation, we try to adhere to the laws. We try to break no laws. You know, we might push them. And, and when Paul Watson did an interview, um, not an interview, he did a speech at the FBI Academy last year, funny enough. And someone stood up and said to him, well, Mr. Watson, you know, you really, really tread a fine line between what's illegal and what's, you know, legal. And, you know, Paul's reply was, well, as long as I don't step over that line, <laughs> you know, there's nothing wrong with it. So, exactly. you know, we, we probably tread the line carefully, but we do try to adhere to the law in every, in every sense of that we can. Um, because if we start breaking the law and becoming, you know, violent and, and, uh, and we will lose public support very quickly and, um, you know, and, and Japan's frustrated because the fact is we've not broken the law and we've never been charged with a felony or any major crimes in the 35 odd years that we've been around and we have been around for 35 years this year I believe so you know we push the boundaries when we can because we want to make a difference but it's becoming harder to make a difference without possibly down the road breaking the laws so we shall see what happens. I used to talk about sailors having a woman in every port. It sounds like you all have a lawyer in every port or maybe several. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, last year, I mean, you know, we like to, we proudly state that, you know, most of our donations goes to the campaigns directly. I mean, I'm an unpaid director. Uh, I don't get paid anything. In fact, you know, a good portion of my wealth goes towards uh, Sea Shepherd and the campaigns we do. And uh, last year, I think we probably spent more money on lawyers than we wanted to, certainly over the last few years. And, you know, we, we, we have won, though, um, in each case, you know. Um, there was a recent arrest in uh, Taiji with the Dolphins, you know, the movie where the Cove was based. And uh, Irwin, who got arrested for being accused of pushing a guy. Now, that's a very interesting case if you look on our website. The fact that he got accused and held for months, you know, um, in jail, in remand, until he was even seen by the courts, just because he got accused of pushing someone is a, an interesting, you know, travesty of justice in our view. Mm-hmm. And it just goes to show you how different laws are in, like in Japan where they've got a 98% conviction rate apparently. So, you know, you're expected to plead guilty even if you're not. And uh, in this case, we were lucky the judge threw the actual case out. But Irwin still had to spend, I think it was two or three months in, in remand in maximum prison, you know, in, in a cell with barely any food and just a mattress on the floor before he went to court. Yeah, that's unbelievable. Um, and I, I think it just underscores what you were saying before about walking pretty close to the line. And I was looking before the show, trying to find information about, you know, people weighing in on the legality of your activities. And mm-hmm. it, the one thing that I found was a little a blurb on the Animal Planet website where they had four legal ep- ep- experts opining on that very question. And Three of the four of them thought, yeah, no, what they're doing is just not really legal. <laughs> and one of them yeah, said, yeah, go on, okay, sorry. well, one of them said, yes, they're under the uh, World Charter for Nature. Individuals have a duty to act. And that gives the legal yeah. justification for the sort of vigilante approach that you guys take in enforcing um, the laws that the Japanese whalers should be following. Yeah, so the problem is, 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 is you've got... It's a, laws are there to be written to supposedly protect the public and you know and the and the people. But the problem is, is over time and governments get entrenched and uh, laws get written and history comes and goes. Many laws don't get renewed or, or, or changed. Um, you know, you have an issue where the laws are become they start to, to serve the people less and, and serve corporations and governments more. And in our case, you know, um, you're at the stage in our in, in society now where there's there's for every law there's someone who can counter it. I mean, you know, quite often we've had arguments on both sides of the fence. You know, are we doing something that's legal? Are we doing something that's illegal? And it comes down to this: whoever in on the high seas. 
whoever's got the largest ships will probably rule rule the waves. And in in the um, instance of the Artigul that was rammed uh, a couple of seasons ago, you know, this was an interesting investigation. Um, Japanese and New Zealand authorities ruled in the end that the both captains were at 50% each you know, negligent in this regards and that there wasn't enough evidence to rule any which way or the other. Although the Japanese didn't cooperate with Australian authorities on the investigation and wouldn't and refused to send any evidence. But um, in that case, you have... Um, they, they quoted in the documents as a final ruling that it, they didn't have enough information to proceed with a thorough investigation. Yet here you had, you know, three camera crews with high-definition cameras. You had 18 CCTV cameras on our ships. You had at least five or six CCTV cameras on the Japanese ship. It was the most documented collision in history, <laughs> right, with high-definition footage. Everyone, yet still everyone argued back and forth who was right. You had stop-motion footage in Australia marine experts, legal experts, and no one could agree who was, who was at fault. And in the end, it, what, what, what that was saying was that the, the conclusion, no one wanted to reach a conclusion because Australia, Australia and Japan is Australia's second largest exporter. And that's what it comes down to. So this is, you've got to look behind why laws are there. And if they're there, will they actually be adhered to and, and will people follow the spirit of the law? And then you know, it's not happening as much as it used to because it depends on whose interest is being fringed upon. Right. Derek, you can point your law students to this show, I guess, as proof that they'll have jobs in a couple of years Absolutely. when they're done. There's going to be a, a lawyer in every port. I'll, I'll remind people that um, actually New York was once one of uh, America's largest ports. So uh, if you need a, a good attorney here, give me a ring. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, hey, uh, Omar, you set up really well for us, I think, um, with your talk about recording and well documenting the things that happened to Sea Shepherd, including when they're boarded by the police. Uh, there is a great piece over at, let me find it now. I just was looking at it. Oh, I'm looking at it now. At Gizmodo. Uh, that is a follow on on the Glick case. And it is a, a detailed piece with seven rules for recording the police. So this is our tip of the week. If you are someone who's in a position of needing to record police action, I strongly suggest that you go and take a look at this piece on Gizmodo in its civil rights section. Section. Um, it, I, I'm not going to go through it in too much detail, uh, but it has great principles. Um, know, uh, know the law wherever you are. And Omar was talking about how complicated that can be. Don't secretly record the police. That was the key point in the Glick case um, about whether you're going to violate the uh, Things like wiretapping laws, if you're doing it in public, you're going to have uh, less chance of doing that. Uh, you want to respond to the inquiries from the police. Don't just ignore them. You know, engage with them, have eye contact with them. Uh, don't be obstreperous. Uh, don't share your video with the police uh, because that could certainly... Um, uh, make them motivated to seize it from you. Uh, you should prepare to be arrested. Uh, know that that's a danger in this activity. You should master your technology and make sure that if you can lock things down so that you're not inadvertently sharing your video with the police, you should password protect things, etc. cetera. Um, don't point your camera like a gun. That's a pretty good tip. Anytime a cop thinks you're reaching for a gun, that's a bad thing. So you want to make sure that it's pretty obvious that you know um, that they know that what you're doing is there and documenting. So um, really good resource, um, I think, regardless of your jurisdiction in the U.S. or the world for anyone who um, is going to make it a habit or even, you know, think it might occasionally come up that they might be report recording the police. So thanks, Gizmodo and uh, Steve Silverman, who wrote this piece for them, who's executive director and founder of FlexYourRights.org and creator of the film 10 Rules for Dealing with the Police. So wonderful um, tip there if you're going to be engaged in that activity. Um, and I, our resource of the week, I'm going to just, you know, turn it over to both Derek and Omar here to plug the heck out of the interesting things that they are involved in. Our official designated resource of the week is the blog that Derek contributes to, the Info Law blog, 
which, um, you know, I think our show today has been a great example of the things we've covered of the things that you guys cover on that blog over on your about page, you write, um, that information law is an obvious convergence of intellectual property, communications regulation, first amendment norms, and new technology. And I think we've touched on all those things today. Um, so thanks so much, Derek, for providing info law as this great resource. And why don't you tell us a bit about the Brooklyn law incubator and policy event this summer or this Sunday? So this Sunday, the Blip Clinic, which is an effort that's led by my friend Jonathan Askin at the law school and by a really dedicated group of students, is coming together to try to hack IP law and internet law. So we saw the debates over the Stop Online Piracy Act and the Protect IP Act. And this is a goal to try to crowdsource, to get together lawyers and technologists and activists and sort of smart people generally, and to see if we can come to some consensus on how to do these things better. So if anyone is in the Brooklyn area, this is just going to be a fantastic event. We're going to have keynotes from all sorts of famous people like Tim Wu, um, and there's going to be a chance to actually do some good. So if you're around on Sunday the 15th, technically tax day, um, please come by and, and see it. We're in, uh, in downtown Brooklyn. Right, and you're moderating the whole Hacking the Act uh, That's right. event. And I'm going to be uh, in the middle. We're going to have people on both sides of the stop online piracy and protect IP debates there. And so uh, I think I'll be uh, sort of refereeing a food fight, which I'm looking forward to. Good. Bring your plastic sheeting. Sounds like you'll need it. Um, I w it would be great to be able to go to this. I love the idea of a legal hackathon. I talked about it last week on the show too. So if you're in the New York area, I think uh, going to this would be well worth your while. Um, anything else you want to let us know about that is going on in your neck of the woods? I think that the other thing is just one of the, the bits that I'd be interested to, to get reactions from your viewers on is that we had a visit from Hollywood in Brooklyn that um, Paramount Pictures has been on a bit of a sort of a road show to talk about problems with um, motion picture piracy and the internet. And so it's something that um, has gotten some coverage from uh, Ars Technica and Tech Dirt and other places. And um, so it's uh, something that's ongoing. And so if your viewers have any thoughts, um, please post comments on the blog and I'll pass questions along for the next round of law students who are going to hear from Hollywood. Great. Wonderful idea to do that. Uh, Omar, you guys have been occupying the Southern Whale Sanctuary long before folks were occupying Wall Street. So please accept my personal thanks for that. And I assume the thanks and appreciation and good wishes of lots and lots of our viewers and listeners. Um, personally, I was a child of the 70s when I was a little girl growing up in California. Saving the whales was something we espoused, you know, in sort of a visceral way. And the rest of the country kind of made fun of us for it from time to time. But it's still very much a part of uh, who I am. So it's great that you guys are down there doing the work that you're doing. And I really appreciate your coming on the show today and sharing some insights about that with us. Uh, tell us about the next season and uh, what else we should look for from you. Um, well, no, first, thanks for, um, for allowing me to be on your show. It's, um, it's been it's very insightful. And a lot of the topics you're talking about, by the way, have, are interesting um, to me with my other hat on. You know, I certainly mm -hmm. am, I'm part of the, um, the Cyber Security Task Force in the UK. And so um, I'm finding all this very interesting. And I'd be happy to come back if you uh, invite me um, to talk about other areas or more Sea Shepherd, if you like. But um, um, this year, we've, we've got a very... Um, a busy year to a point. At the moment, the three ships that, that you see in the show, the Bridget Bardot, as I said, is going from Perth to Melbourne shortly. Um, the Steve Irwin, the flagship, is currently moored up in, in Melbourne, in Williamstown. And the uh, um, um, Bob Barker is in Hobart. They're all doing tours at the moment. So if any of your listeners are Australian, um, please contact Sea Ship at Australia. It's just, uh, you can browse it on the internet. It'll come up with the phone numbers and you can find it some details about visiting the ships. But the ships are going to be sitting in port because the fuel is very expensive. And uh, in previous years, um, you know, we, we, we would hit the Mediterranean campaign uh, for the Bluefin Tuna campaign, but this year we're, we're not going to do that. Um, I'm, I'm going to Cannes and Paul Watson, Captain Paul Watson's going to Cannes to do some fundraising there. But uh, 
Um, in the next couple of months, there's a uh, shark campaign that's being formed. And, um, and in this year, mostly we're preparing for the next year in that regards to the ships with the technology. The ships are getting some maintenance done to them and we're not going to uh, send them around like we do every year. Um, um, so be more preparations for the next year because next year there's a lot going to happen. And, of course, you know, you've also got 20 or so episodes to, for the public to enjoy. Although we are in the business to be one day out of business. That's our goal. <laughs> that is a good goal. And it's really interesting too. You were mentioning how social media is sort of your fourth boat. I guess your fifth boat is all of the documenting that you're doing of the activities. You know, I mean, I guess you could just be out there uh, fighting the good fight without documenting any of it, but it's the documenting of it that enables you to go to con and raise money. And so it's a real interesting convergence of media and technology that you guys find yourself at. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I believe firmly that uh, Sea Shepherd is at the forefront of utilising the latest technology um, with, a, with a very small budget, comparatively speaking, to other organisations like Greenpeace, um, while using the best diverse talent that we have within our ranks and uh, with an inspirational leader uh, like Captain Paul Watson. And, I, you know, I tell you, um, if, if anyone's out there and has a chance to see Paul and he's got, a, um, I believe, a talk coming up in, in New York and a 35th anniversary in Colorado, Colorado, I suggest they go and um, check him out because, uh, you know, he's uh, a very inspirational character. He's been doing it for a long time. Um, I was um, a little bit sceptical when I heard of him initially. You know, I was a, uh, a business guy, you know, in IT and I thought, oh, you know, whale huggers, you know, what nonsense. But once I uh, looked into it a little bit more, um, I realised that, uh, the, the, you know, what he, what he talks about, which is biodiversity and that the fact that our oceans have to survive, if our oceans die, we die, it started to strike a chord. And of course, it does start striking a chord when you're our age, doesn't, doesn't it? You know, your 30s mm -hmm. or 40s, you start thinking about, you know, if you've got kids, you know, are they going to, you know, move on? What's the future going to be like? So, yeah, definitely. So, I would encourage anyone to have a look at what we do and, um, and you know, possibly contribute. And uh, hopefully, we can all make a difference. Right. And one way that you've been trying to increase your reach and make more of a difference is on Google Plus, where you and I ran into each other. Uh, you've got your own personal page there and the Sea Shepherd has a page. Uh, yes, where where well, else are you uh, reaching out with the fourth boat there? Uh, OK, well, we've got the uh, I'll put them on the uh, tw to the ISC link here. But, um, you know, we've sure. um, basically our Google accounts, um, you know, people can follow me because I might say a bit more personal stuff. But really, you know, follow the Sea Shepherd if you want to see them, the latest news on the Sea Shepherd accounts. Um, we're on Facebook. Of course, we're on Twitter under Sea Shepherd and, and uh uh, Omar and Sea Shepherd. Um, and, um, you know, we do have Instagram accounts. We have all the accounts. You just look for Sea <laughs> Shepherd and we appear everywhere. Um, but I'll, I'll put the links up for the Google Plus and the Google Plus page. We, you know, we would like to increase followers on that because um, it's very new and uh, and there's not many one there. I mean, it seems quite quiet, Google Plus, to me at the moment. But, I, but then again, I look at someone like yourself and I think, my God, she's got uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of followers. So uh, it, it must be, we just must be not out there yet. Yeah, I just, I, I think the pages in general, since they la launched later, that there has been slower uptake on them. But I encourage you to stick with it because there are, the growth on that social network has been unlike anything I've ever seen. You know, I just, there are graphs out there that show how much faster people have gotten on it than Facebook or Twitter or something else, you know, like that in their infancies. Um, so I, I don't think it's going anywhere. And I definitely think that there are, you know, millions of people in a truly global audience on that network that I'm not used to seeing really anywhere else. So I think it's a great venue for you um, and hope you'll stick with it. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, if, you know, I'm happy to uh, come back on the show and, uh, and maybe if, um, if, if I can um, convince Paul maybe or someone else to jump on the show as well, which would be a special thing. Um, sure. you know, Paul, Paul's starting to see the benefits of social media. I, I certainly had to initially kick, uh, drag the organisation a little kicking and screaming into the, uh, the modern era. Um, but of the last couple of years, you know, um, usually hear a big scream on the ship if the Facebook page goes down because he's on Facebook <laughs> quite a lot now so <laughs> that's um, great it 
it's now it's becoming to a point where the, you know the comms officer lives or dies on the ship depending on if the internet's running or not. So it's a precarious role to have. <laughs> That's right. And and on the high seas, I'm sure that becomes more complicated than yeah. than just in the average office environment. Um, well, guys, this has been so much fun. I'm so glad that you were both able to join me. Uh, Derek, have a great time this weekend at the Hackathon. Uh, we'll watch your blog and, and your Twitter to see how that all was. And uh, keep up the great work in New York. He actually had to run, so uh, he's, oh, he's, he's gone. Left. Well, Derek, uh, goodbye in absentia. It's uh, it was wonderful having him on. What a great guest! And Omar, I just am thrilled to have had the chance to chat with you here today. It's been great, great fun. No, no problems. Uh, thank you for having me. All right, and and you've mentioned a couple times. Yes, I would desperately love to have you back. We will coordinate that. And and you know, once again, I realize it's going on a very very wee hour of the morning here for you. So um, we'll definitely have you on at a point where you feel like doing an all nighter once more. Oh, no problem. I I'm a global child these days anyway, so it's no problem for right. me. Okay. Well, uh, wonderful having you on. And uh, thanks so much, everyone who joined us today. Uh, after the show, you can check out our Google Plus page or our Facebook page where I post up things between the shows that we're going to talk about and uh, hope to hear from you about what you want to hear about next time. And you guys are my stringers. You know, I hear from uh, folks f who are listeners and viewers of this show uh, before I actually see the new legal decisions that have come out because you guys are watching them like hawks. So I really appreciate uh, your cluing me into new things when they happen. And uh, we'll chew over them in more detail as we can with the great panels that we get on here. Uh, you can also email me. That's Jeff. I'm Denise at twit.tv or you can find me over on Twitter. I'm D Howell there. Uh, and you can find our show at twit.tv slash twill. The whole archive is there. We're in iTunes and in various places where you like to look for video and podcast entertainment, including YouTube. So however you enjoy the show, we're glad that you do. And we hope you'll keep coming back to This Week in Law. Take care. Take care.